Derby is a much underrated city, often dismissed as merely an industrial town in the Midlands. Yet it's been in existence, in one form or another, for nearly 2,000 years. And the industry and trade so long associated with the city has produced a built landscape that bears elegant testimony to the endeavours of Derby people through the centuries. This river, the Derwent, flowing north to south through the city, is the thread that binds all the elements of Derby's history. It has enabled communication and trade and been a source of power. As such, it's inspired the city's long and distinguished line of entrepreneurs, scientists and artists. This is the silk mill, right in the heart of modern Derby and probably the first factory in England. It drew its power from the river. Nearby stands the city's cathedral. Its roots go back a thousand years to the time when the settlement on the Derwent began to flourish. But to find Derby's real roots, we must dig even deeper. Even by the time the Roman army arrived in 43 AD, the Derwent was already a conduit for communication. An ancient trackway ran from Leicester across the Trent, along a spectacular causeway at Swarkston, and through the site that would eventually become Derby. The region was settled by a Celtic tribe, the Coritani. They had a flourishing Iron Age culture. Their territory for the time being reached into the Pennines, but their capital was at Ratai Coritanorum, now Leicester. The Derwent, which still bears its Celtic name, has its lowest crossing point a mile north of Derby. At this point was founded a Roman fort that lasted until about 80 AD. The late first century saw peace and tranquility in central Britain. New civilian settlements were established, including one to the east of the Derwent. This was Derventio. The new town was a sophisticated and comfortable place for its inhabitants, with a flourishing industrial quarter, substantial buildings and suburbs. There's evidence of some of the creature comforts enjoyed by the inhabitants. Archaeology has also uncovered several wells, two of which are still in situ and are dressed annually in the traditional Derbyshire fashion. The new settlement became the focus of several Roman roads, and even today, two principal Roman streets cross the settlement, Old Chester Road, and City Road. Derby's four centuries of Roman rule have left an indelible mark on the modern city. Eventually, the period of peace and prosperity came to an end, with unrest breaking out across the province. Derventio responded by throwing up a substantial defensive wall around the town. The town seems to have survived in some form even after the collapse of Roman government in the 5th century. The bastions were rebuilt in the 10th century and there were at least two farmhouses within the old walls, themselves destroyed in 1720, built directly onto Roman foundations with no visible layer of destruction or abandonment between. For a century and a half after the departure of the Romans, Derventio sank into obscurity. And then, the Saxons arrived. They came from the east, using the Trent Valley as an artery of communication. They swept down the river, establishing settlements as they went. These Saxons, the Mercians, set their capital at Repton, organizing themselves within the old Coritanian boundaries. In fact, the site was used long after the Mercians had moved their capital to Lichfield. Their kings were buried here in increasingly elaborate shrines. After the death of the pagan Pender in 655, Repton became a Christian monastery, founded by St. Werburgh, daughter of Pender's successor. The crypt of the present parish church is a monument to the power, wealth and accomplishments of the Mercian kingdom with its spiral-twisted columns supporting a sophisticated vaulted roof derived from Roman prototypes. It was here that the Repton Stone was found, depicting King Ethelbald, the warrior king. 
Werberg died in the year 699, but her presence lived on in a number of parish churches dedicated to her, including one at a small village called Wardwick, later to be included in the Saxon borough of Derby. And then there was a church situated on the ancient trackway between the Derwent and Markeaton Brook. This was founded at around the same time by missionary priests sent out to reclaim this increasingly pagan region. Within two centuries, this building would become resting place to the remains of the Northumbrian martyr prince Olkmund as northern Christianity fled before the onslaught of the Vikings. Derby was a, play, a town which had two foundations. Um, the Romans came in the beginning of the first century AD, founded a town, not really where the centre of Derby is today, and after 400 years, that town collapsed, passed away, moulded to dust, and then there was a long period when nothing much happened. The Vikings came, they looted and raped and pillaged, as everybody knows, they came up the Trent Valley. They stopped at Repton over the winter of 873. Here, the Vikings dug in for the winter, building a fort and encompassing the church. They even buried one of their leaders here in a traditional burial mound, now flattened, in what is now the vicarage garden, surrounded by the remains of several hundred of his followers. A quick survey of place names in the region shows the extent of the Viking influence, such as Normanton, the village of the North Men, now a suburb of Derby. For over 40 years, Vikings controlled Mercia. They re-fortified the abandoned settlement of Deventio, taking the first part of the name and adding the characteristic B-Y ending, hence Derby. In following decades, the area was torn between Viking and Saxon. Eventually, the Saxon king Ethelston gained the upper hand and formed a fortified settlement south of the Old Minster Church of St. Olkmund, to which he transferred the name Derby. These superb carved stones are part of a series of monuments which once stood in the church, including this wonderful stone sarcophagus, which probably held the remains of a local elder man, buried close to the saint. He also built a new Minster church, All Saints, which he endowed with lands liberated from the Vikings, including the former Deventio. These lands together added up to a sizable borough, overlaid with a grid of streets with a defensive ditch between Markeaton Brook and the Derwent, immediately north of St Alkman's. The new borough was to a great extent Norse. At least three of its streets bore the characteristic gate, meaning street. St Mary's Gate, Sadler Gate and Iron Gate. They spread out from an ancient trackway running between All Saints and St Alkman's. Their names reflected the presence of smiths and leather workers in the growing settlement. Thus, the borough of Derby, a direct descendant of Roman Derventio, revived by the Saxon kings of all England, had been founded. By the time the Doomsday Book was completed, the modest Saxon borough of Derby was a well-established and prosperous town. Churches sprang up along the line of the ancient north-south trackway. Four out of the eight known at the time are still in use, though not necessarily as churches. The oldest was probably St Werberg's, now much rebuilt and adapted as a shopping arcade. All Saints lost its collegiate and monastic status in 1549. It became a borough church and in 1927, Derby Cathedral. Its massive early 16th century tower is the second highest of its kind in the country. St Alkman's, rebuilt in the 1840s, fell victim to a disastrous piece of town planning in 1967. St Peter's, south of the brook, is the only original Derby church still used for worship, apart from the cathedral, that is. It even retains much of its medieval fabric. From the 12th to the 15th centuries, Derby was a monastery town. On the northern outskirts lay the Abbey of St Mary Darley, Derbyshire's largest monastery. Many will remember the superb country house and park on the site. 
It was destroyed in 1962. And all that remains of the great Augustinian monastery is an old stone building near the river, converted in 1979 into the striking Abbey Inn. Nuns Green, right in the heart of Derby, took its name from the sisters of St Mary de Pratis. Now only a built-up tract of land and a neglected building in Nuns Street remain. And there was the 13th century Dominican friary in Friargate, site of the present friary hotel. Its high quality interiors have been ravaged by 70 years of trade. But just beyond the walls of its basement lies the last grim reminder of its former life. Here were buried a generation of Dominican friars. Follow the course of the river towards the city and you come across St Mary's Bridge. Perched on one end, with its medieval piers still evident, is a tiny bridge chapel. There are only four other places in England where you'll find anything similar. But if Derby was a town dominated by its monasteries, it was also a thriving centre of trade. The most spectacular monument to this part of Derby life was the marketplace, created around 1100. The site echoed to the cries of street traders for well over eight centuries until it was swept away in a desire for municipal tidiness. The first town hall was built here in the 15th century, on top of the town lockup. Near it stood the Shambles, a rickety old building let by the corporation and replaced in 1700. Markets could be found dotted around the area. On the moorage beside the river, where the road was wide enough to cope with the crowds. Stalls could be found here on Cockpit Hill as late as 1973. Cereals were traded at the corn market, where the ancient North South Trackway widened. Beasts and dairy produce were traded at the wide west end of Friargate, next to what had been the old Roman road. Here, during the plague of 1637, Townsfolk dipped coins brought in by country traders. They filled the depression in the top of the headless cross with vinegar, a primitive disinfectant. Today, there are few obvious signs of medieval Derby left. Most of the characteristic narrow streets have been widened, with the notable exception of Sadlergate and Amen Alley. Perhaps the true medieval legacy is the entrepreneurial spirit that still flourishes in the city. It was that same spirit which would carry the people of Derby through the uncertain times ahead. Once the Derby monasteries were dissolved, um, we are into a whole new area of of activity because the um, people of the town who had any money bought up the sites of the monasteries and uh, built posh houses. Um, and other people picked up the smaller pieces and the really local business life took off again. But the abolition of the monasteries left a gaping hole in educational provision. As an attempt to remedy this, a grammar school was built in St Peter's churchyard. The original building survives just a short walk from the city's main shopping area. Turbulent times were ahead. Derby had its fair share of religious martyrs. Like Joan Waste, a Protestant burned at the stake in Windmill Pit. Then there was the gruesome fate of three priests, Nicholas Garlick, Robert Ludlam and Robert Simpson. Their severed heads were displayed on St Mary's Bridge as a grim warning to others. The seesawing of allegiances came to a head in the English Civil War in 1642. Derbyshire was strictly royalist, but the county hadn't reckoned with Sir John Gell of Hopton Hall, a fanatical parliamentarian who seized control in the town. He set out to purge the council of all opposition and build up a power base. This partly took form in a fine mansion, some would say one of the finest Jacobean houses in Derby. It can still be seen, complete with brick gabled facade. From here, Jell took the campaign to the heart of Royalist Derbyshire, defeating the King's forces at Eggington Heath 
Swarkston and Wingfield Manor, among others. Derby stayed in parliamentary hands throughout the period of the Commonwealth. The town that had learned to adjust to the times embarked on a period of stability and prosperity that would bear fruit right into the 20th century. Public buildings began to appear in the centre of town. There was Shire Hall, built in 1659, later known as the Old Crown Court. This is one of the city's finest buildings. Its massive rooms were designed to impress. In its heyday, this was the venue for all county functions and assemblies, concerts, receptions, public meetings and assizes, before being superseded by the assembly rooms built in 1714. In the 1790s, a hotel sprang up next door for lawyers and plaintiffs, the King's Arms County Hotel. To this was added a grand set of judges' lodgings. It's more than 20 years since a judge has stayed here, but the rooms still display some of their original furniture and fittings. The carpenter responsible for Shire Hall was Roger Morledge. His son, another Roger, was the architect behind a wave of rebuilding which embellished late 17th century Derby. Lloyd's Bank nearby was originally a residence for a rich alderman. It stood next door to one of Derby's most famous coaching inns, the George, its facade survives, testimony to the unlucky owner who'd unwittingly encroached on public land. As a result, he had to take out a 999-year lease on a strip of land 45 feet by 6 inches. The splendid and fashionable marketplace mansion of local apothecary William Francis had ceilings frescoed by the painter Francis Bassano and ornamental garden ironwork by Bakewell. Robert Bakewell epitomizes the high standards and sheer quantity of building work being carried out in 18th century Derby. This helped to turn an ordinary market town into a regional centre of excellence and is a lasting monument to numerous ordinary craftsmen with extraordinary skills who made their contribution. Their presence is triumphantly epitomized in All Saints Church almost completely rebuilt between 1723 and 1775. The new church was designed by James Gibbs, the eminent London architect. He based his ideas on St Martin's in the Fields, but the workmanship is strictly local. Bakewell was responsible for the breathtaking wrought iron screen. Luke Needham and Abraham Denston did the plaster work, and the carpentry is by Thomas Trimmer. Some of the finest sculptors in 18th century England provided the monuments, including local man Richard Brown. It adds up to one of the finest Baroque provincial churches in England. All in all, this period was one of peaceful expansion out of the glare of public affairs, until the 4th of December, 1745, when a sequence of events would unfold in Derby that would alter the course of English history. That was the day when Bonnie Prince Charlie marched into the town at the head of nearly 8,000 Highlanders. He got a good reception, not wholly surprising since most of the Whig opposition had fled to Nottingham. Prince Charles Edward Stuart took up residence at long since vanished Exeter House, the Derby residence of the 8th Earl of Exeter. His officers were billeted in the finest houses in town. The day after his arrival, the Prince made great efforts to rally the local gentry. Nonetheless, an advance party was sent to Loughborough and pickets set on the southern approaches to Swarkston Bridge. That same evening, the fateful decision to return to Scotland was made. The Prince gave a party at the assembly rooms, where the attendance was so great, his standard was knocked over in the crush. In the small hours of December the 6th, the Prince's army quietly withdrew to Ashbourne, and Derby was left with its place in the history books assured. really the fact that Derby evolved as an industrial town almost by accident 
through a series of quite extraordinary people who happened to be at the right place at the right time and the transmission of ideas from one to another. And it all began really with the Duke of Norfolk's agent, a man called Halton, who came from Lancashire, settled it in the ruins of South Wingfield Manor and, and uh, spent his entire time looking at the stars through a crude telescope. Came to Derby regularly, uh, met the son of Stephen Flamsted, a shopkeeper, although he was the son of a gentleman. Um, and his, Stephen Flamsted's son was John Flamsted, a Derby school pupil, who was fanatically interested in astronomy and the stars. And he got, he learnt nearly everything he knew at first from, from Halton, until Halton could tell him no more. And then he got a scholarship to Cambridge, and um, he, he was uh, up there with the young Isaac Newton, got more of his ideas together, came back to Derby, and um, he drew maps. Um, he, he drew maps, first of all, of Derby, um, and eventually he drew a map of the heavens. The 18th century burst upon Derby with a brilliant display of scientific exploration and innovation. This was entirely thanks to the groundwork laid by thinkers and scientists of the preceding decades. Men such as John Flamsted, first astronomer royal and educated at the Derby School. He was a friend and rival of Isaac Newton and was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. Flamsted made regular visits back to his hometown and here met the young George Sorokold, a brilliant engineer with a head for business. In 1693, he took out a lease on the old gunpowder mill by the river in Derby and built an apparatus to raise water from the river to a tank behind St Michael's Church. From here, it ran into a system of elm pipes and thence all over Derby. Sorokold was a wanderer. He built and franchised out similar schemes for many English towns, including the city of London but his shining achievement lay in the field of industrial engineering and architecture, in particular, Derby's silk mill. The process of throwing silk had for years been a closely guarded secret on the continent. Industrial espionage was called for, but it would be dangerous. It was a Derby man who was willing to take on the challenge, John Lom. He managed to pass himself off as a southern Italian, and found work in a silk mill in Livorno. By night he made sketches of the machinery and sent them back to England, hidden in bales of silk. These were made up into prototypes in Derby's Guild Hall by his cousin, Sir Thomas Lom, and George Sorokold. The next step was mass production. Sorokold set his sights on an island in the Derwent. Here he built a massive five-storey mill, its large water wheel driven from a specially constructed mill race. By the time John Lom had returned from Italy, narrowly escaping discovery, the whole operation was ready to run. With the Industrial Revolution still half a century away, the enterprising spirit so characteristic of Derby had given England its first factory. For the first time, all the relevant processes were under one roof, drawing on a common source of power. Despite a fire in 1910, the mill still stands proud, if not quite so tall, as Derby's Industrial Museum. Sorokold's mantle was taken up by his protégé, John Whitehurst. A clockmaker by trade, he had first made his mark with a clock for Derby's new guild hall. From here, he went from strength to strength, raising standards in every discipline he set his mind to. From barometers and scientific instruments to geology, and especially hydraulics. Whitehurst's scientific connections were impeccable and included the Scots astronomer and mathematician James Ferguson. He was the inspiration behind a collaboration between Whitehurst and the American scientist Benjamin Franklin. If ever Derby's stars were in conjunction, it must have been now. Ferguson came to lecture in the town. In the audience was a young painter, Joseph Wright. He was inspired to produce the stunning and memorable work A Philosopher Lecturing on an Orrery, the very instrument showing the movement of the planets around the sun, employed by Ferguson in his talks. Meanwhile, at Kedleston Hall, seat of the newly ennobled First Lord Scarsdale, a young architect was at work 
Robert Adam. Also on site was another London-trained architect, Joseph Pickford. Pickford's friend, the Birmingham entrepreneur Matthew Bolton, was experimenting with using the famous local Blue John on one of the hall's fireplaces, and Joseph Wright was himself providing several canvases for the house. He was also creating a record of the rise of a group that would have a crucial role in the timing and development of the Industrial Revolution. This was the Lunar Society, an unofficial coming together of like-minded individuals, which also included Josiah Wedgwood. Because Derby was a county town, and Derbyshire was full of really quite well-off gentlemen living on landed estates, it attracted a certain amount of patronage. People could come to Derby, they could buy expensive consumer goods, and uh, they could have their portraits painted and all things like that. And um, a, really, as the 18th century went on and prosperity increased, so a real cultural momentum started to take place alongside the scientific momentum. People came from far and wide to buy porcelain. Very little serious development had taken place in Derby before the 1760s, except, that is, by notable private individuals. In Queen Anne's reign, Samuel Crompton, Derby's leading banker, had given the town the piazzas and undercover shopping development in Marketplace. The Derwent navigation to the Trent had also been formed, and in 1764, a new assembly rooms had been built through public subscription. An act was passed, allowing the corporation to sell house-sized plots on Nuns Green. Unfortunately, the trustees of the scheme, the Heath brothers, were far from even-handed in dealing out the plots. One of these went to Joseph Pickford, who built his own fine house, now the town's Pickford House Museum, providing a snapshot of late 18th century Derby life. Pickford's greatest work is the superb St Helens, the finest house of its type north of London. John Heath's criminal dealings were exposed and his Darley Hall site was turned over to another banker, Thomas Evans. He built Boar's Head Cotton Mill and his son was responsible for the creation of the beautiful Regency village at Darley Abbey to house the mill workers. People like Erasmus Darwin were busy having ideas about using machines to develop industry and things like that. And it's one of the reasons why Derby was an early, an early industrial town, because these men were here and having all these ideas. And there were plenty of people around with the money and, in a, and ability to get them put into practice. Erasmus Darwin was an original thinker like Whitehurst, of course, but um, Strutt was a man who tended to put them into practice. William Strutt, he was an amateur architect with a talent for invention. His greatest contribution to the development of Derby, however, was in his chairmanship of the Improvement Commission, in the teeth of opposition from the local gentry, the rest of Nuns Green was enclosed and the profits were used to improve the town. Mark Eaton Brook ran through Nuns Green and was quickly seized upon as a valuable source of power. Instead of townhouses, factories sprang up along the watercourse. These were mostly silk and narrow tapes mills and many, like the astonishingly tall Ricknold Mill, site of one of the first notable trades union conflicts, still survive. The sale of Nuns Green freed a great deal of finance for Strutt's commissioners, who immediately set about improving the town's infrastructure. They promoted the Derby Canal as a replacement for the less efficient Derby navigation. And a new bridge spanned the Derwent at St Mary's to replace the medieval version. They were also responsible for paving and lighting the town and enabling the foundation of the Derbyshire General Infirmary. Finally, Strutt organised the watch, the prototype for the Derby police, also helping to develop the watchman's clock to regulate patrols. At last, the spirit of private enterprise was being channelled for the public good. Here were the roots of modern Derby. If Derby was to build on its past success, the spirit of enterprise had to be nurtured for future generations. But the local old grammar school was in decline. 
What the town really needed was an establishment that offered a science-based rather than a rigid classical curriculum. The answer was provided by Matthew Spencer. He set up a school in Green Lane that could boast all the latest equipment. Here, Spencer's grandson Herbert helped with the teaching and acquired from Strutt and Darwin his love of innovation and science. Later, in 1824, he provided a scheme to prevent the Derwent flooding the town. Incredibly, this was not adopted for 90 years. This type of education was highly attractive to the town's elite, and they were soon sending their sons in droves. But what about the less privileged? In the 1790s, Derby had some 8,000 citizens. This shot up to 44,000 in less than 70 years. To meet the needs of the growing urban population, new streets and sewers were laid, and the brook was culverted, creating the gracious lines of Victoria Street. There were new churches and a jail, and in the 1820s, at last, schools for the children of the less privileged. Soon the town was to strike up an affair with an industry that would last right through to the modern day. In 1839, the railway arrived. Not just one, but two lines. The Midland Counties Railway to Nottingham and the Derby and Birmingham Junction Railway to London via Birmingham. These were soon joined by the North Midland Railway to Leeds, engineered by none other than George Stevenson. All three amalgamated in 1844 under the auspices of the Railway King, George Hudson of York, and thus was born the Midland Railway. As a result, the southern end of town, centred on Litchurch, underwent a sudden and dramatic development. The area blossomed with iron foundries to supply the railway company with rolling stock and equipment. The quiet fields of New Normanton, Pear Tree and Litchurch became crisscrossed with rows of terraced houses. The downside of development, of course, was the loss of public land, in particular the homes. For 40 years, this had been the town racecourse. Into the breach stepped the philanthropic Strutt family. This time, it was Joseph, brother of William. In 1840, he acquired an 11-acre plot of land and developed it into Britain's first public park, the Arboretum. For sixpence admission, free on certain days, people could enjoy over a thousand varieties of trees, elegant buildings, fountains and statues. Fates, carnivals and balloon ascents were staged there. Strutt died only four years later and the Arboretum passed into the hands of the borough. The arrival of the railway sounded the death knell for the local stagecoach network. Yet it wasn't until 1880 that the tramways were established, electrified from 1904 under the auspices of Strutt's great-nephew, the Honourable Frederick Strutt. The tramways, however, couldn't have been possible without extensive road widening plans, undertaken by the council between 1867 and 1926. The face of the town was changed forever, but not before it had been recorded by pioneer photographer Richard Keane. His impeccable connections with the photographic elite, including William Fox Talbot and Canon Abney, put Derby in the thick of scientific endeavour in this period. Keane's photographs, dating back to this view of Exeter House in 1853, have a kind of limpid clarity that would be impossible to reproduce today. By the turn of the 20th century, gas and electricity were readily available in the town. The company of Henry Royce and Charles Rolls, based in Manchester, needed both, and cheaply. Their subsequent move to Derby is a milestone in the history of the city and its people. When Rolls-Royce came to Derby, it brought a new lease of life to the foundry business. It also set into production the company's first classic motor car, the Silver Ghost. Cars would be manufactured on the Nightingale Road site until the outbreak of the Second World War. Alongside the high-profile motor cars ran the aero engine business, begun in 1916. Before long, the aero engines had acquired as high a reputation as the cars. They were the force behind record-breaking flights 
and the Merlin engine made an immeasurable contribution to the battle for the skies in the Second World War. Here lay the future of the Derby plant. As the town's workforce increased, so did the need for homes. New suburbs were created. Ulverston, Allenton, Bolton, Chaddesden, Normanton and Sinfin. Electric trolley buses replaced the trams in 1932. And at the same time, the town acquired a ring road to carry through traffic away from the town centre. The early 30s also brought dramatic developments to the west bank of the Derwent. The old lead works of 1809, complete with shot tower, were demolished. And in their place rose the avant-garde bus station, built along the lines of a railway station with curving platforms canopies, restaurants, offices and cloakrooms. The architect was the borough's Charles Aslin, who was also responsible for an open market, a huge new council house, magistrates' courts, a police station and a new bridge over the Derwent. By the 1950s, Derby's entire prosperity rested on the railway works and Rolls-Royce. The older industries, silk, Precision tools, narrow fabrics and iron founding had either vanished or declined. But the process of expansion continued. Mackworth, Mickelover, Littleover and Allestry were absorbed as villages into the town and expanded. And new parks were created, mainly by absorbing country house estates. Chaddesden, Mark Eaton, Darley, Osmerston and Allestry. But what cost progress? In the 1960s, an inner ring road arrived, cutting a brutal swathe across the city, destroying the only remaining Georgian square and the city's most ancient place of worship, St. Olkman's. Many fine buildings have fallen victim to the developers, including the old mayor's parlour of 1487. At the time of its destruction in 1948, it was the largest timber-framed urban townhouse in the country for its date. The site is still empty and plans to build a hotel here may never come to fruition. Derby, which has never lost the air of a county market town, is still nonetheless an industrial city which can respond to rapid change in the industrial climate. If the railways have declined, Rolls-Royce have moved into nuclear power. And 1992 saw the revival of car manufacturing in the city after 50 years absence with the massive new Toyota plant on the site of the old municipal airport. The future looks positive and has been backed by a significant injection of government city challenge money, some 37 million pounds. Derby achieved city status in 1977 as part of Queen Elizabeth's Silver Jubilee celebrations. Not before time, the people of Derby would say. Derby has to be unique because it's the only town of its size which is as well preserved and elegant as it still is. And it's really because of its legacy of excellence in the 17th and 18th century. Um, and the fact that it was a county town right through to the present day, a market town, that it's kept its 18th century atmosphere and its small town atmosphere despite having a girdle of industry thrown round it. And today, of course, the girdle of industry is still there and although it's diversifying madly and parts of it are closing down, it's still a first-class provincial town with a lot of Georgian buildings and a wonderful atmosphere and really a town not to be missed in any circumstances. After nearly 2,000 years, Derby is a city which is better preserved, more vibrant and has made a greater contribution to the scientific and industrial history of the British Isles than most others of comparable size. With a heritage like this, surely it can't remain the Midlands' best-kept secret for long. <laughs>